A big thanks to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video and offering my viewers 83% off and 3 months extra for free. SpaceX Starship updates, Rocket Lab opens second launch facility and Blue Origin launches again. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? And as always there has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship update! Prototyping a Starship, the way SpaceX is doing it right now seems to be a bit of a back and forth. On one side of the construction site they're disassembling even the nose cone right now and on the other side they're producing first parts for the next generation. SpaceX has officially started disassembly of the Mark 1 nose cone. So it's all back to square one for Mark 3. Apparently the whole design for Mark 1 was not good enough for pretty much anything except for an overpressurization test. Most of us would probably not have expected this after the presentation. Sadly, there is no clarity or any official information why SpaceX will not even use the nose section for future tests. Is it the weld quality? Is it the canard fin design or maybe the whole internal structure? There are multiple possible reasons. First of all, the weld quality most definitely was about the same as for the tank section. So overall not very good. On the other hand though, the nose section has separate header tanks and thus does not have to take the pressure that the tank section had to withstand. A second possible reason could be the weight distribution. SpaceX seems to have found out about the tail heavy design and the resulting very low center of gravity fairly late in the building process. SpaceX then tried to change the setup by implementing the header tanks, originally thought for inside the tank section's oxygen tanks, into the topmost part of the nose cone. Was this still not enough to get the center of weight up enough for the intended flip maneuvers in the atmosphere? What about the canard fins? Are they the reason for the disassembly? Musk said that the next generation flight design would be quite different. Many questions with few answers besides some educated guesses. One thing we know for sure now is that Mark III will use a different technique to build the famous rings every Starship hull was made of so far. On my last episode I did a deep dive into where this technology is coming from and what a fully developed process looks like at other companies with more knowledge about the process. SpaceX right now is far from what that looks like. The Boca Chica rings are not welded together. They're basically just metal bands right now laying around in the open. Is SpaceX still testing the process? If so, did they contact professionals in the business or are they trying to find their own way? The Coco rings made with the coil building process were never used to actually build a hull. Rumor has it that this was due to all of them being slightly different sizes resulting in unusable rings for construction. Are we seeing the same problem again? It feels like we're right in the middle between what seemed like a purpose driven Mark 1 construction and a Mark 3 that has not really found a new way yet. SpaceX is still busy getting rid of the old ways and in the middle of preparing the new plan. What will it look like though? This is another of those new beginnings. Where on Mark 1 SpaceX used normal construction scaffolding to build out the internals of tank section and fairing. This structure presumably is a pre-built internal construction scaffolding specially made for Mark 3. This will most likely enable SpaceX to build internals quicker than on Mark 1. A dedicated structure and not an on the fly construction will be much better suited for the purpose if SpaceX has a solid plan of what the internals are going to be on the next generation Starship. No doubt another lesson learned. And on we go. Another indicator for SpaceX seeming to go a more serious way with the next Starship generation. This very much looks more and more like a whole different story. The orbital launch facility. Even the sign on the fence suggests the real deal. And right next to it? The brand new landing site. Never before used. Sitting there like us. Waiting for a new and worthy generation of Starship prototypes. Was it all too early? Too fast? Surely not. SpaceX must have learned a great deal on what not to do and what to do differently from now on. One of the biggest questions right now is when SpaceX will release a new and revised timeline. That would make the waiting process much easier. Keep in mind though that when SpaceX releases this new timeline it will still just be a loose frame subject to change every day. That's the SpaceX way of prototyping. Build it fast, try it out and iterate. Rocket Lab opens up second launch facility. 
This episode could have also been called news that barely didn't make it into the last episode. I talked about Rocket Lab, the Electron Launcher and that its reusability project is mainly focused on increasing launch frequency. And that Rocket Lab is right now in the process of building a new launch facility at the NASA Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. And on the evening of publishing the episode, Rocket Lab goes live on YouTube announcing that they're done building the facility and that first flights will be as early as the beginning of 2020. It took Rocket Lab roughly 10 months to build Launch Complex 2 and it will be a huge improvement for US SmallSat customers. Rocket Lab has already launched 10 rockets out of the New Zealand based Launch Complex 1 and this makes Electron the fourth most frequently flown launch vehicle in the world for 2019. This is a very impressive achievement for such a small company. With a flawless launch record and almost 50 satellites delivered into orbit, Rocket Lab is making its way up on the list though. The first launch from Launch Complex 2 will be a dedicated mission for the United States Air Force Space Test Program set to launch early next year. Peter Beck said in the live announcement that Rocket Lab is honored to be able to launch out of Wallops which has a long history in commercial flights. The commercial launch sector is growing steadily with more and more companies successfully building a business in the space industry. Rocket Lab is just one of many. Blue Origin launches again. Where Rocket Lab is rather small but well established, Blue Origin is exactly the opposite. With a budget many magnitudes larger than Rocket Lab's, they have yet to orbit the planet. On December 11th, Blue Origin launched their new Shepard rocket. NS-12, as Blue Origin calls the launch, was this booster's sixth launch and the ninth commercial payload mission for Blue Origin. New Shepard is Blue Origin's small sub-orbital launch vehicle intended to get space tourists into space at one point in the future. The launch went as expected. The rocket reached above the Kármán line into space, separated itself from the capsule and had a controlled descent including a soft landing on the pad. The capsule did an equally flawless job again, deploying parachutes and touching down softly again after a total of 10 minutes and 16 seconds of flight. Blue Origin's new Shepard is out of its prototype phase by now. The rocket has not received any updates on its hardware for several flights now and according to Blue Origin only needs minimal refurbishment after each flight, making it an ideal candidate for space tourism. The current flights, even though they have payloads on board, mainly work as validation flights for the system. If you want to send humans into space on board a rocket, you have to have a very reliable launcher. So Blue Origin has to have as many launches as possible in the books before they can start boarding passengers. If you follow my episodes on a regular basis, you know that I cover their progress often and as much as I can. They are part of this ever-growing commercial launch provider team and every member counts for our future in space. Because their work is so promising, SpaceX and all the other commercial launch providers are being watched 24-7. As a YouTuber, being watched is something I'm used to as well, but what about the moments I don't want to be watched? My new sponsor, Surfshark, might be the right solution for you if you want to drastically improve your online privacy and security with the click of a single button. The modern advertisement industry can be very intrusive and is bound by very few laws. They collect data on every move you make online. It's a bit like in a James Bond movie. Every phone you use, most emails you get, they are tapped. Surfshark ends this. Establish your own set of rules. With Surfshark you can protect yourself from data theft, tracking, surveillance and commercial targeting. By putting a VPN between you and the internet, all these streams of unauthorized data are cut and other data streams are opened up for you. Ever noticed that Netflix has different movies for each country? Want to know what a baby Yoda is but you're not from the US? Access should be a right, not a privilege. Surfshark gives you all the access you need. Just connect the service and refresh the page. Access granted. Surfshark is the only VPN to offer one account for use on an unlimited number of devices. One account and one subscription for all your needs. I use Surfshark for free and it is super convenient. Use my code to get 83% off and 3 months for free and at the same time support what about it. Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee so there is no risk. Surf with your own rules, link is in the description. So this wraps up today's episode of what about it. When will we get a new timeline for Mark 3 and would you take a ride on a Shepard rocket? As always, tell me in the comments.
Episode 59 finished. Researching, writing and editing until it's worth an upload. But every step is closely followed and helped with by my patrons. I could not have hoped for a better community in the inner circle and I am super happy to have everybody of you on board with me on this crazy ride. Without my patrons, what you just saw would just not be possible. And as always, there are new members on the team. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Leon Galanti, Thomas Scheer, Luke Barbaya and Aronius Maximus. You rock! Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, remember to hit the like and the subscribe button because that helps the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content. As this gives me the time to focus on what I love doing the most, to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. I talked about the rocket... The rocket lab. I talked about the rocket lab on the last episode. Get to the chopper. Give these people air. Oops. That originally. Oh. Unusual rings. <laughs> One of the biggest questions right now is when we will get a bigger starship. <laughs>